Amanda Shea from Kings Park, and uh, she'll be presenting on um, the nursery approaches to propagation challenges. So thanks, Amanda. Great, thank you, Cherie. Let me just share my screen. Um, Now, can you guys see the notes page or not? No. No? No, there's no notes, no. Excellent. That's good. That's good. <laughs> but we okay, can see so... the next slide. We can see two little pictures of oh, the Oh, okay. Slides. No. So then that's how's good. that? Yep, that's, that's better? Yeah. Excellent. Great. Um, well, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, probably, for most of you. Um, thanks for allowing me this opportunity to, to talk very briefly. We've only got 10 minutes, so I'm really going to just be scraping the surface and I'm going to be talking um, a little bit about some different propagation challenges. <laughs> so um, this is going to briefly um, cover some of those challenges and considerations in propagating for nursery collections, um, for in-ground collections, for other purposes that a lot of botanic gardens grow for. Uh, at, at Kings Park here we grow um, a range of WA species for many different purposes and I suppose the diversity in both the, the species that we work with and the intended outcomes mean that inevitably we're going to come up with a range of different challenges. So the first step that we that we take with any propagation activity is always in the planning, really, really important. It's the why, the what, and the how. So firstly, we'll, we'll look at the why, what purpose are these plants that we're growing going to have? Um, you know, what is it for a container collection? Is it for in-ground collection? Is it for trial purposes? Is it for succession planting, bulking up numbers of threatened species, that sort of thing? Um, secondly, it's what, you know, what are the species we're propagating? Have we tried it before? What worked? What didn't work? Um, everything that we can learn about the species, where it comes from, those sorts of things. The more we find out about a species that we're working with, the better the starting place um, for the propagation. And then thirdly, it's the how. This is often the easiest thing to figure out. Uh, are we doing it from seed, from cuttings, from grafting, from something else? And with that, what kind of variables do we need to consider um, or, or what has been in the, in the, done in the past that we might be able to modify to generate better results? So while planning is essential, there's always going to be challenges. And these are um, things I'm sure every nursery has experienced um, to varying degrees. I know that screen looks blank. I'm going to try something. I hope it works. Um, so you can plan as much as you like, but certain challenges, both expected and unexpected, are going to arise. Oh, it worked. Um, so things like, and, and these are from our experiences, trying to propagate species from really diverse environmental conditions and habitats. In our case, we grow things from all over Western Australia. And, you know, with its vast range of environments from the south coast to subtropical northern Kimberley environments to the deserts and so on. And there's only so much modification of growing environments that can be done. Um, to best replicate the natural environments. And then we've got infrastructure challenges. Um, I'm sure we'd all love the latest technology glass houses and propagation facilities, but in reality, that's probably a bit of a pipe dream for most of us. Um, so we have to use our imaginations a little bit um, and come up with some really workable solutions um, to either modify or retrofit the growing environments to suit the particular species or, or groups of plants that we're working with. Um, then there's the unknown factor. I touched on that briefly in the last slide. We often receive species that we've um, we've never cultivated before. Nobody else has ever cultivated or propagated before. So good research, as I mentioned, is really essential in these cases and also an ability to think outside the square and to try new things. Um, also timing is, is another challenge. Sometimes we get material sent to us at perhaps not the best time of year to ensure good success. Um, and then there's complexities of things like seed dormancy and other physiolog physiological, it's a hard word at this time of the morning, um, challenges with some of the material that we get. So with some of this in mind, I'm just going to go through a few um, quick case studies of some of the things that we do here and how we've addressed some of those challenges. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is our, um, our summer annual collection that we grow every year. So the challenge with this one is the timing. So the timing has to fit with the end use requirements. So we grow a lot of 
um, annual, um, sometimes perennial, but we treat them as an annual species from northwestern Australia, dry, arid interior. We use them as a summer display at a time of year when there's not a lot of colour around because everything else has pretty much stopped flowering. So being um, being a summer display, our hort team wants them in the ground well before Christmas, which means that our nursery has to sow them in September. So September here is generally still quite cool and wet, and it's not really conducive to germinating these things that come from northern really hot environments. So we, we're growing out of season, essentially. So how we get around that is we obviously need to grow indoors in glass houses. We put everything that we sow onto really hot heat mats and it's incredible how quickly a lot of this stuff germinates. Sometimes it's two to three days and they've already started popping up. Um, on the other hand, when we do the bulk of our propagation for, for our garden collections, most of that is southwest species, so southwest WA from sort of Shark Bay to Esperance and everything south of that imaginary line on the map, if you like. And most of those things that we are sowing will naturally germinate in winter when it's cold and wet, but we're growing them in summer because our hort team want a six to nine month old smaller plant. So we are sowing seed that naturally germinates in cold, wet conditions often on 40 degree days. And how we get around that, another modification of environment, we have a, a cool room that is modified um, to essentially perform the functions of a large fridge. So we can trick the seed into thinking that it is winter. Um, this is just a nice pretty picture of the final display. Um, some of these might be annual, um, perennials or, or biennials in their natural habitat, but because we don't have the environments or we don't have a glass house, a public glass house to display. We really have to sort of also rethink how we look at these plants. And even if they are perennials, we have to treat them as annuals. The second one I want to talk about is, uh, is this species here. So at Kings Park, we've got a long history of growing and displaying really resilient species to include in our collections. So a lot of things from some more, some of the more hostile regions in WA um, that are really going to be our plants of the future as, as climate change continues and the, the climate becomes drier. And so displaying these in our garden collections helps to promote the use of more climate suitable species, not just for home gardeners, but for industry professionals as well. So the challenge with that is that we wanna promote species like this, but we don't wanna recommend plants if they're really hard to prop. And this one for many years was really difficult to prop. We were having really limited success with it. So um, we really needed to run some trials to figure out how would be the best method to, to get this to reliably um, be produced. So a number of really sort of fairy and woolly species from arid regions like this one that we've propagated before have shown really encouraging success with the use of rock wool as a growing medium. So rock wool is a, a hydroponic product. Um, and so this species, Physopsis crassophila, also has really tactile and fairy stems and foliage. So we naturally assumed that this would perform using the same methods um, and it didn't. But that's okay. Uh, as we teach all of our trainees here, a zero result is still a result and can really help us understand what we may need to change in order to improve. So we went back to square one and we undertook a whole range of different trials. We looked at all the different variables associated with cardinals propagation. We looked at what we had the ability to modify and also what combination of changed variables might provide the best result. Um, so we tried a whole, whole heap of different things and then a team member had a light bulb moment. So ordinarily we would take out the really soft tips of species like this one because they're really prone to wilting. And her suggestion was let's keep the tips, let's put them in a really shallow propagation tray to maximise that heat transfer. Let's use a much lower concentration hormone, put them in a fogging tent so it's got high humidity but um, and no overhead watering. And it worked. And we can now, using that combination of factors that we've changed, can really get this to strike reliably. And we are producing it in large numbers now. So sometimes it's a really small adjustment to your process, but sometimes it's a combination. And in this case, it was a combo. But it's also something that um, didn't happen quickly. This was this was a few years in, in the making in terms of changing those different variables. So that continued change and um, trial and error and changing all of those variables until you hit on the, the winning combo is, is really important. The last one I want to talk about is this species here or this taxon. This is a critically endangered naturally occurring hybrid. 
uh, is from the northern sand plains of WA. So because it's critically endangered, any seed that is stored has really high conservation value and so therefore has limited availability for use. For us. So the challenge here is access to material. Um, also, I mean, the seed does have significant variation anyway because of its hybrid status. Cuttings from eucalypts, pretty tricky. So we decided to try grafting with this one. We didn't know the exact parentage at the time when we started this grafting project. So we had to make some considered decisions about the potential rootstock from a compatibility perspective. So this is where research comes in. We consulted with eucalypt experts. We looked carefully at species with similar characteristics that grew naturally within its similar range, other species within that classification series. And we landed on two different species to trial um, as a rootstock initially, which was Macrocarpa and Burracopanensis. So we use mummy grafting techniques for this species. So it's really our go-to method for a range of eucalypts, carimbias, a lot of genera from dry inland regions like Eremophila and Verticordia, because we do this technique primarily over our hot summer months. So mummy grafting uses essentially the same techniques as a standard cleft or, or a wedge graft, but with the added step as we, we strip all of the foliage off and we wrap the entire scion in, um, in grafting film, or in our case, we use laboratory film. We put these in a really hot glass house. Oops, sorry. Um, we put these in a really hot glass house that can get up to about 50 to 60 degrees on hot Perth summer days, and we will see bud bursts sometimes within a week. So since we've started using this technique, um, for selected genera, we've seen really increased um, success rates. And what that has meant is that we can now display these, uh, these a lot of these species in the, uh, in the gardens that we previously were not able to. So the challenge with this one, twofold, limited access to seed and the unknown, because we just weren't sure how it was going to perform. So adopting specialised techniques like this can often result in um, a greater range of species in greater quantities, more diversity in our collections, more conservation messages getting out to the public, really important. But most importantly, I think it's helped build on our horticultural knowledge that we can share with others. Um, and also production of threatened species like this or vegetatively means we're not impacting on the natural population. So we've now got this established in ground um, as well as in containers as a backup in our nursery and they're continually monitored for their performance and we've got some really useful data so far about how the two different rootstock have have performed in terms of longevity long-term compatibility but also overall condition and that feedback on the longevity helps us to fine-tune our rootstock selections for long-term survival in the ground and i think you know, the trialing doesn't stop once they leave the nursery, which I think is one of the wonderful benefits for, of working for a botanic garden nursery. So some quick conclusions and take home messages. I realise that's very, very quick scraping the surface, but um, I just want to encourage people um, who come up against different propagation challenges. Don't be afraid to try new things. Don't be afraid to suggest new things within your team as well. Really important. Um, be prepared to think outside the box. Some of our biggest discoveries, for want of a better word, um, have been the result of taking risks that seem quite ridiculous in concept, but have actually worked, um, or have been the result of us really wiping the slate clean in terms of what we would normally do and having a bit of a brain reset. Also, and I can't stress this enough, and everybody knows this, but I'm just gonna say it anyway, make sure you document absolutely everything um, documentation record keeping is absolutely essential when it comes to propagation. I'm not telling anyone anything they don't know, but the tiniest detail might may seem insignificant, but often it's the key to cracking a really difficult species. And finally, talk to each other. Our botanic garden community is so generous with their time, um, their advice, and really helpful huge range across the whole network as well. Um, so there's no need to reinvent the wheel sometimes. So really don't be afraid to seek advice from others within our propagation network. I think the more we all work together, um, the better we will all get at this. And that is me. I hope I haven't gone over time too much. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Um, that's now, fantastic. <laughs> um, we'll just move on okay. to the next um, presenter. And yeah, we'll um, keep questions to the, the end of all the presenters. Really hard to hear you, Cherie. Oh, sorry, Michael. Yeah, you have to go in close. <laughs> um, so next up is Candace Parker from Greening Australia. 
and she's a senior program officer and she's uh, going to discuss SPA, so seed production areas. So I'll hand over to Candice. Thanks, Sheree. Uh, if some of you are wondering, um, we are sisters and we do look alike. <laughs> so um, just a heads up. <laughs> You're not saying um, double double screen. Hope that's good. Everyone can see that one. Um, yeah, yeah. Good. Yep. Yeah, my teams. I think I must have it on something setting, so I can't say anyone. So that's okay. Um, I'll just talk to the screen. Um, yeah, so I work with Greeny Australia. I've been working uh, with Greeny Australia for 15 years. Uh, a little bit longer now um, in quite a diverse um, landscape um, down in Geelong, but I also work through to sort of Hamilton Way. So um, as you can imagine, a lot of different landscapes um, that I work in. But Sheree um, asked me to talk today about our seed production areas uh, that Greeny Australia have set up um, over time. But just a quick background about Greeny Australia, if you don't know who we are. We are a not-for-profit organisation and we're all about restoring landscapes um, out there. Obviously, Australia-wide, we've got um, staff located across lots of different states. Um, we were established in 1982 and, um, yeah, we're just continuing to grow and, and get out there and do lots of restoration work with um, both across private and public land. So um, these are our 2030 goals, but I guess I just circled the um, the goal, I guess, that I was going to talk to today around the, the native seed that we need to supply for our restoration projects. And it's one of the, the biggest um, needs, I guess, for us in order to expand our restoration efforts is, is being able to have seed that is reliable. Um, yeah, in our, in our restoration efforts, just it, for direct seeding, but then also growing in our tube stock as well. So getting on to seed production areas. So this is a site in WA in the Wheatbelt, um, a property that Greeny Australia purchased, Jarriga. Uh, it's a 2,000 hectare property um, and they're going to restore about 1,400 hectares uh, and they're starting to put in a 100 hectare seed production area of mixed species, so um, shrubs and trees. Um, and ultimately our seed production areas are generally plants that you would find you know it's hard to collect out in the field there's not a lot of large amounts of it out there so by um, coordinating our efforts and having these um, a bit more you know bigger populations that we can collect seed off um, making it a lot easier to get you know the bulk of seed that's required in some of our restoration efforts if you can imagine how many tons of seed we would need yeah to restore even the 1400 hectares on this property let alone all the other restoration work that's happening around the country so just a, a quick sort of um background, I guess, on the need for seed production areas or spas. Uh, uh, traditionally, the uh, you know, I've worked with the grassland spas. So as you, as everyone knows, our grasslands are really, really threatened and there's not a lot out there. So we don't really want to be putting um, that demand on, on wild harvest and, and taking from those really small populations. So by, you know, creating these spas, we can, um, like I was saying, just increase the, the amount available for harvest. Um, but we're also putting them in a uh, nursery horticultural condition. So we, we're supplying them with enough water and nutrients that we can get really reliable volumes of seed uh, over time so that we can then put those back out into a, into our restoration. Uh, so then I just yeah thought I'd just run through a few setups. So this one's um, the Native Seed Centre uh, in Western Sydney. So it's been set up uh, a lot of grassland plants within this setup, but there's also um, they have a really big cleaning and seed storage facility as well, where our seed gets sent to. Um, yeah, they dry it and um, clean it all and pack it all properly, ready for for restoration and or um, clients that might be purchasing seed through Greeny Australia. So Greeny Australia do have, a, um, they do own a seed, Nindathana Seeds. So they do own um, that company. So our seed um, goes through into that, um, that business. So these are just a few more, um, just a few more ideas really about setting up 
uh, these ones are all in ground, um, you know, obviously using the weed matting. So we're controlling the weeds um, and then and really bulking out how many plants we're putting within each garden bed. Um, I'm not sure what time what we actually planted grassland plant wise, but um, it almost looks like bulb ones, but I'm not too sure if they were lily, bulb one lilies or not. Um, yeah, so these just quite, they're actually quite easy to set up if you've got a bit of land and they were all irrigated um, just to make it easier. And then quite easy then to come along and harvest bulk amounts of seed. So those are probably, um, we can have those ones quite small or you can create those at really large scale with that in-ground production. Um, but then if you're looking at something, uh, we started off, you know, more in these containerized systems. And this is something that some of the land care groups around the area have started as well, where they've been able to collect and propagate their own grassland species, collect seed, and then use it in some of the local projects that are going on in the area. Uh, and these are, relatively low cost to set up. They're just boxes collected from, um, you know, like the fruit and veg place, uh, if you want to start small. Uh, and then we've just you know, filled them up with the, the potting mix and then um, propagated and put the, the grassland plants in them. So they're, they're all irrigated. Uh, and then usually we turn these over between two and three years. We find that we've sort of exhausted the plant, but it's also great to be able to then go back out and get more genetic diversity out in the field. So we're bringing that into our uh, restoration efforts, like a really good genetic integrity. And then just some more examples. So these, this is um, set up at a property in Warndu. So again, I've really focused on the grasslands. It's traditionally where I've had the most input in setting up these seed production areas. Uh, and these are just, um, the landholder has set these up um, within his nursery that he had as well, um, just putting in um, boxed and raised garden beds. And we do find, we, we have set up some different systems based on the types of species that you're growing. So we have some created some sort of walls where we've had like um, your convolvulus and things like that um, climbing up. So it's a bit easier, the seed will drop down and we're, we're able to collect a little bit easier. So you can kind of modify your containers to, co to collect the seed, um, you know, the different types of seed that grow within so many different species. And then I just thought I'd put some photos. So obviously this is a lot of work collecting this amount of seed. Uh, it's obviously it's quite light, most of our, our uh, grassland seeds. So it takes a lot to get this volume, but this is mixed with a bit of grass seed as well. Uh, so we usually create these grass herb mix that then go out into our restoration projects. And, um, and then this is just in Geelong, a site in Geelong where we've got um, We've grown the seed within our seed production area. We've been able to then um, direct seed it with the, the tractor that you see, uh, which is a modified turf seeder uh, that puts the grass seed out for us, um, rolls over it. And then, yeah, we like to, and then the grassland um, hopefully comes back. It does take a few years. It is quite dependent on our climate um, as to, to when the seed germinates. Um, and this, this site's now a few years old. And that's it. Yeah, there's. I'll, I'll give this presentation to Sheree so she can share it, but you're more than welcome to get in touch if you have any questions. Um, and then I've also just chucked some resources on the last slide if that's of interest. Um, I'll, I'll, obviously, it'll be on the slide and Sheree will be able to share it, um, just of a few different projects that we have happening at Greening Australia. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Candice, for that. Um, and we'll head over next. Speak up, to, Cherie. Oh, sorry. We'll head over next to um, Tony Hughes. So he's a teacher at uh, the Gordon TAFE and specialising in propagation and plant identification. And he'll be presenting on grafting native. Thanks, Tony. Thanks. Okay, so um, like Sheree said, I've been teaching at the Gordon Tate here in Geelong for about 20 years now, but my original qualification is um, in a production wholesale nursery here as well. And what I've found with students and most people is they're really scared of doing grafting because it seems so fiddly, but uh, in reality, it's not that hard. 
the problem with Geelong is we have really wet winters usually um, and fairly dry summers. So a lot of the desert eremophilus, which are quite pretty, uh, struggle through our winters. So we've been grafting them onto my forums, which there's a couple growing, a couple growing native to our area. Um, I'm just flicking through a few slides to show some of the nice eremophilus we've been doing. Um, and also the last year or two, we've been grafting prosanthras uh, for the same reason that they struggle in our winters. So I usually do a bit of an introduction with students, like how to tell them apart, and that this group probably I can move forward so we don't have lots of time. Um, I'll just get through the grafting bit. So the reasons to graft, we're adapting desert or dry land species to our wetter environment. The good other part is you can get a lot more um, plants out of each piece of material, so you only need about three nodes to five nodes uh, for our actual graft, where a cutting obviously needs a bit more. Um, the rootstocks we've been using, the myoporum, so we have two myoporum insula, which uh, is the big boobiella, grows to three to five metres sometimes, quite a big tree, so it ends up having a very big rootstock at the bottom, and myoporum montana, which is a lot smaller, which is actually the one we prefer. Um, you can see the size difference in the end sizes, so that impacts a little bit sometimes to absorb the material. Um, Procenta rootstocks, lots of people have been using Westringer and Yabby Gem, but we've Sorry, Tony, I'm not sure if it's just me, but I can't see, I can only see the PowerPoint, not the actual slideshow. Oh. Press, press F5. I did. Give me a oh. second. Um, give me a second, I'll try and unshare it. Um, I won't share proper. I'll go out and see if I can do it again. Why does it do it when you're away? Uh, I don't know. For some reason, I can't get it to share. Second time now. Is that working now? No, not yet, Tony. What about now? Yes. Yep. yep. You've just skipped okay. a few slides, I think. Yeah. yeah. What can you see now, Pro Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah, cool. Okay. <laughs> um, not sure why it did that. If you click slideshow, maybe. I thought I did. Can you see them changing now? No. 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 It looks like you're on a home page of PowerPoint. If you can see them from there, I'll just keep working through them. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. So there was the prostantha, the rootstock um, we chose was prostantha scutelloroides, which uh, survives really well in both our winters and our summers. So um, it's been particularly useful. And I've been working a lot with Miriam Ford, who's completely pro for obsessed to try and get more varieties down here with our students. Um, I'll just skip through a little bit more. So normally with our rootstocks, we do a pretty much the same size cutting. So we're doing cutting grafts. So we do the cutting of the rootstock and then we graft onto it at the same time. It's uh, quite an efficient way of doing it. It's easier for the students and for people with their first time, for example, worry about the roots flicking around and getting damaged. So we make our normal size cutting um, like you can see here, and we leave about three centimetres above to graft onto. The cyan material, small bits, three to four nodes. We don't need any more than that. Um, and you try to make sure the cyan and the rootstock are the same thickness. It just makes it easier to join them back up. Using scalpels, we cut them to the wedge. So we do a wedge or a cleft graft, um, and just making sure that the vascular system each side lines up with our rootstock. It does take a little bit of practice, but Eremothas in particular are very forgiving with this. So they're really good to um, get people confident when they first do this. Um, like Amanda said before, we're using a laboratory film. It's called Parafilm. Uh, it's nice and stretchy. It goes a really long way. And what we found is if you put just the right amount around your graph, it actually breaks off in the sun. It goes very long and falls off by itself. So you don't run the risk of ripping your graph apart trying to take the film off. But one little strip, about a one centimetre wide piece, Will stretch out so much you can get about three graphs out of that strip so it's very efficient um, and then doing it once we've done our graph we just wrap them up with parafilm start at the bottom work our way up in about five or six mil increments till we've covered the wound up onto the sign and then back down again and that makes a nice waterproof graph 
with plenty of support for the graft itself. Um, we need to keep the water out to stop it forming different types of tissue instead of the xylem and the phloem that are already there. Um, I'll make sure there's a copy of this presentation available because there's a little video inside it um, showing grafting as well, so for the tying of the graft. So that's what it looks like when it's finished. You need to make sure it's firm to keep those tissues together, uh, but it's, it's a bit of practice. It's really not very hard, and I've found, I've done this like the last five years or so, probably five or 600 students all up, and after the first or second shot at it, they're usually quite confident. It's way easier than you think. Um, once that's done, we just treat them like a normal cutting. We dip them in our hormone. We tend to use powder at the Gordon because it's fairly forgiving um, from a contamination point of view. Plant them into a heat and perlite mix and then into a sort of dome protected area. I also have a capillary system for ours so that the pots themselves sit on the capillary mat, soak the water up from the bottom to water the material inside the pot without getting the top of the plants wet because, like I said, they're desert type species. Um, and they don't really like being wet. So that's always been a bit tricky for us with students. But having a capillary system, we just tell them not to water the top of the plant. Uh, we keep the capillary mat wet all the time and we have really good success with it. Um, also, we've got little watering cans things we've made up. You can either buy these little watering heads or drill out a soft drink bottle, but that lets people water between their actual grafts so that again, the foliage stays dry. We have a number of different domes. This is my ones at home. Um, and I can get really good results out of these. You only have to water them maybe, or top up the water in the mat, maybe once a week, even when it's hot. Uh, it still keeps them humid, doesn't let them dry out, which is sort of important. And you can fit quite a lot in one pot. Um, the main thing we just have to do is keep them from getting too wet and so on. We have quite a lot of humidity for our autumn and spring period, and winter, of course, is humid and cold, which is terminal with some of these things. At the Gordon, we have a, a bigger setup, so we've got a capillary tray at the bottom, and then this dome thing, which I actually bought from Bunnings for fifty or sixty dollars. It was incredibly cheap, and it works really well. And we can get a lot in there as well. The biggest thing is just training the students not to water everything like normal. Uh, once they've sort of taken, it usually takes between three to six weeks, depending on the time of year. Um, you see obvious shoots from the top or out from our sign material. The tricky thing is to manage the growth from the rootstock. And myoporums we use because they're vigorous and tough, but they do grow back very fast. So we just get uh, our little snippers and cut off the growth. We want to leave the original leaf because that leaf is still supporting the, the cyan material on top. They just stop the bottom from getting going too much. And once again, this is actually quite easy to do. It's just a week from inspection. Um, I've got some more details there. So again, keeping the leaves and just removing the points of new growth and being really careful not to dislodge the graft. You also have to check that none of the rootstock uh, shoots up from around the graft, because that seems to really interfere with things if it does. So there's a before and after. It doesn't look that pretty sometimes, but give it a couple of months and then we remove these all together once the sign material is about the size of a sort of ping pong ball or so. Um, and that's that shoot I was telling about. So these are really bad because oftentimes if they shoot out, it also damages the way the material yields back up again. So you want to get on them straight away. Once we've had them strike and the top's really growing well, then we pot them up singly. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with cuttings, but we don't have to take the perlite and everything off the root stock. At the roots, it doesn't do any harm to leave some on there. So just transplant them into 60 or 75 mil tubes. And we mostly use 60 because they fit in these nice little trays, which gives them plenty of airflow between them plenty of support um, and they can't accidentally be knocked over once you've gone through all that effort of getting them to work. Uh, once again, when we pot them up, we leave them in our big hot house so it's a bit more humid. Um, and then depending on the time of year, if it's winter, we move them into one of our smaller hot houses that has mesh sides but a plastic roof. So we keep the rain off and but lots of ventilation. Um, in summer, we tend to bring them outside sooner. Um, then when they're growing, we just have to keep the inspections up for a little while while the top's growing, make sure our grafts are nice and tight. Um, sometimes you'll have bits of old pieces of the, the rootstock sticking up. We trim that back so it can't accidentally get hooked on something. Um, but usually we get a nice firm graft like this, um, and there's the actual plant as it's growing on as well. Other things just to consider is the parafilm that's left over. So people you know, have this urge to take it off. We just tell them to leave it and eventually it dries out in the sun and cracks off. If it won't, then you can take it off. But if you go too early, 
we run the risk of dislodging the graph, which we've just spent months working on. But there's some signs of some really nice graphs there as well. Um, the other thing, I'll post them for magnitude. That's what I was saying about little bits left over. It is nice to trim them off um, just so they don't get hooked on things as well and break the graph. So that was sort of fairly quick, but the presentation itself has got a little, little bit more in it in this PowerPoint. Uh, but we find with the students that just getting to do one or two goes that it gives them confidence to then move forward and then have a go at home themselves. Uh, which is the sort of thing we want to encourage. So there you go. Thanks, Thanks Tony. Tony. No problem. Um, next up, we've got uh, Dermot Malloy, the senior curator at Royal Botanic Gardens, and um, he's presenting on Araucariaceae collection at Melbourne and its development and propagation. So thank you, Dermot. Thanks, Cherie. Um, is my screen being shared right now? Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, we've got a few slides to get through, but um, yes, this is the um, my journey with the Oricariaceae, Agathis, uh, Woolamai, and um, Oricarias. Uh, next slide. Um, so at the Royal Botanic Gardens, we have a landscape succession strategy, and this um, forms um, what we do in the gardens um, going into the future. So the strategy will um, guide the management of Melbourne gardens through climate change into the next century, um, conserving rare and distinctive plants. Uh, this is a very brief um, uh, synopsis of the strategy, but it um, highlights the effect of climate change, contributes to scientific knowledge and general education, reduce running costs, minimise soil carbon loss, improve mental health and well-being of garden visitors, assist in reducing air temperature. Um, and you can follow that link there because this is being recorded. So from that strategy comes the Living Collections Plan, which underpins our scientific research, visitor programs, and all our beautiful landscapes and horticultural displays. Uh, the RBGV has 23 collections. There's a link to that in the PDF there. Um, then that goes down to a living collections management plan, which provides a brief history of the collection, location within the gardens, uh, the theme of the collection, uh, and major donors to the collection. From that plan, um, all the curators, um, uh, this collection plan outlines tasks for curators to develop the collection over the next year. So that, involves things like plant sourcing, plant IDs, labels and interpretation, professional development, and um, we want to protect and duplicate representation of rare and threatened species. This is an example of our collection action plan. It's just a, a few brief things. These are actions that you put in every year um, to just guide the curators through their collections, some professional development, some interpretation, making sure they're doing records, label requests, and also uh, plant acquisitions. So the Oricariaceae collection at RBG is important because it displays the unique forms and aesthetic these trees bring to our landscape. It conserves rare and threatened species such as the Woolamai pine. Uh, it identifies species tolerant of future climate change. So back in 2005, I was asked to propagate five new species by the previous collections curator. And as propagator back then, this got me hooked. Um, the curators also use the climate assessment tool when they um, want to introduce new plants into the gardens. So this is an example here of Agathis microstachia. Currently, current risk is in the blue, so it's too cold for it. It's, it's getting better into the aqua. And green here is climate suited out to 2070. So being a, a records management group, I uh, thought I'd just show you our uh, accession form. So this is an Agathis lanceolata that I was um, propagating. It's got a parent number, its destination, and most of these are, are grafted. So I've got a, a bit of a record there um, and how many uh, we want. Uh, then we have a propagation record. So this is 
back in 2011, I grafted five plants there. Um, a few months later, I've got five tubed and then five potted on. And I've got all the detail over here on the right of where they're going, any, any notes that I want um, for the future. And I can refer back to that. So into the propagation, um, through researching, I decided uh, side veneer grafting was the way to go as it's a, a common method with conifers. So I start with the rootstock preparation. Um, the, clear the graft area of any foliage. Um, you make a long, shallow cut, and then you make a second cut, which you can see here, so that the, the graft will sit in place. Then when you're uh, preparing the scion, another really long, shallow cut here, and then another cut on the back of it here, so that you've got cambium on this little tag here and a cambium join uh, with the main stem there as well. Um, then we seal that graft with grafting tape and place on bottom heat with uh, high humidity. And then we slowly uh, trim the rootstock back. And this could take four to six months, but you've got to keep the energy going into the scion. Um, then just as Tony was explaining, we do the same thing um, with cutting grafts. This is just using the side veneer technique, um, but the plant has no roots. So where the rootstock is, in our case, Agathus robusta, we would do the veneer as normal, and then we would wound the bottom of the rootstock and apply hormone. And then we would place it in a under bottom heat and a really high humidity environment around 75 to 80% humidity. So this is an example of a graft union after two years. This is uh, Agathus corbisonii. You can see a really nice 45 degree graft union there. Um, it, it looks ugly at the beginning, but it, uh, it, it does form a nice tree. And in the background here, you see all the other grafted species I was trying. And so, yes, after um, two to three years, you get a plant that's four or five feet tall and it's ready to plant. Um, as for trialing, as we all like to do a bit of research, I tried a number of rootstocks, uh, Araucaria heterophylla, Araucaria bidwillii, Agathus robusta. Um, and we are basically trying to graft New Caledonian species at the gardens here because we can't get access to seed from New Caledonia of these um, new species. So we are grafting from uh, various collectors around Australia. Um, Agathus robusta was the best by far. Uh, it does sucker on some of the species. Um, and as a trial, you see my, what I call a Franken plant here. This is my Woolamai nobilis side shoot grafted onto Agathus robusta. And that was just to see if they would graft one or if the rootstock was compatible, but um, it suckered like mad. So it's still growing to this day, just as an example, but it was well worth a try. The best plants you'll get are uh, growing them from fresh seed. Um, and you have to sow that relatively quickly after it sheds. Um, we sow it very shallow and cover it lightly. Um, and the, the female cones are released in Australia around January, February. So in the top right here, you've got the male and the, the female cones down here. And the, and the bottom right is a full um, that I grew from seed. Um, from the gardens. So um, the reason that we wanted to graft is, um, so we've got an example here of Agathus montana. We grafted that onto Agathus robusta. So we get a plant that size, and then 10 years later, we've got this one here, which is about eight foot tall. That's the same plant, uh, full of cones. And the whole reason for grafting is probably to get the seed, because that's going to produce a better plant in the long run. So since 2005, these are the, the species that I've um, grown and grafted or did cuttings or got seed donations. And I think we've got one left in the nursery now. So, um, and they, um, sorry. Um, so I've written down here collections and connections. So this is the best way to increase the diversity of your collections is just getting to know collectors, 
nursery people um, visiting places around the world. Um, I've had great experiences with Alistair Watt, Lachlan Andrews, Peter Teese from Yamina, um, visited Bernard Suprin. He wrote The Flora of New Caledonia, um, visited him last year in New, New Mia. And also this company here, uh, which is called Cirrus, they're a revegetation nursery in um, New Caledonia, and they've got three rooms full of seed like this, so it's um, nice connections to have. Also, donations are very important. So we, we receive a lot of donations of cutting seed or whatever over the years, but we also like to spread our risk by donating. So Andrew Smith at Burnley Gardens, um, one of my Agavis uh, Maori eyes going into Melbourne University um, for their 150th anniversary, and another uh, Agavis Maori eye down at Warrnambool Botanic Garden. And just one last thing, I went to New Caledonia last August and we got the opportunity to go to this Goro Plateau. This is a newly described uh, oricaria. This is called Oricaria goroensis. Um, if you look far into the distance over here, uh, a nickel mine is coming its way across here. Uh, so all of these trees are going to be mined basically. So the company that we visited we're rescuing these seedlings and you can see how small they are. That's 20 years old. And the one here on the left, that's a thousand years old. So they are uh, take forever to grow. Um, and so it was a great opportunity. And thank you very much. Thanks, Dermot. Thank no you. worries. Uh, thanks to all of our presenters. Uh, did anyone have any questions if they want to just maybe raise their hand or um, even just off mic and and just ask the questions? Um, I had one for uh, Amanda about um, data collection and just do you, um, I saw Dermot's um, collection, but do you um, is yours kind of similar or do you do um, you know information on one sort of species? Uh, how do you sort of collate that information, I suppose? Yeah, we use a database as well. We use um, something called BG Base, which um, I think Adelaide is the only other place that was using it. It's it's a world um, data database, I guess, um, prescriptive for botanic gardens and herbaria, arboretums, that kind of thing. And it, yeah, so it has um, the capacity to record every minute element of whatever propagation we are doing, but it also links to, um, it's a very comprehensive database. It links to all of our field collection data, um, our specimens, our germplasm in our seed bank, where all the plants are in the garden. So it's got a, a whole lot of different historical elements to it, um, but it was developed uh, internationally so there's a lot it's it's used all around the world mostly in the northern hemisphere but there's a lot a lot of stuff in there that we don't use but we just take what we need from it and use um, document the, the bits that are really important for us and I think um, in terms of having a database like that is really important because you know if I left tomorrow and all my team came with me the people who replace us don't have to reinvent the wheel. They've got all of that that information, that historical information there, which is really important when it comes to propagation. Thanks, um, Amanda. Uh, did anyone have any questions? I can see that um, Rebecca is typing, but I'm not <laughs> sure if she's got a question. <laughs> Actually, Sheree, I've got a question for Dermot. Yep. Um, Dermot, with the with your grafting of the Arac, Arac, I can't even say it, of the that group of plants you spoke yes, about. Yes, yes. Um, we we have a real issue. Like that's not something that we would do. But I'm I'm perhaps interested to have a chat with you offline about um, potential sourcing of material because we're quite restricted in what we can resource over here in Perth. But um, do you have any issues or concerns with Agathis robusta and its susceptibility to die back because we are finding ours are being really affected as climate change, but also a lot of dieback issues. Is that something that you experience? Well, 
actually I experienced, I was in Perth last November visiting Dave Hancock's nursery and he took me down south and all those, I think they're Norfolk Island pines, he said they're dying in droves. Mm. Um, I'm not entirely sure what's going on there, but something's going on. Um, I've never had any trouble here with um, Agathus robusta uh, dying off or dying back. It's it's even just self sowing in the gardens here really well. Okay. Um, yeah, because we have quite a large number of um, mature trees. Uh, but I can I can chat to you offline if you like. Yeah, I've got a few other questions, but I'll, That's yeah, right. I'll take it That's offline. Right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. I think Rebecca just um, typed in the chat about. Um, Great with Amanda's note about trying something different, and I think um, Tony and even Dermot sort of um, mentioned that as well. That um, yeah, just to get out there and I suppose give give everything a go. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, just document everything. <laughs> yeah, nursery uh, people should be allowed to tinker just a little bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the stranger, the better. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yes. Have Frankenstein plants everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, Claire, did you have a question? I just wanted to um, add to the Agathus robusta. So I thought I'd just do look it up quickly in the climate assessment tool that Dermot referred to. And um, even for the 2050 climate, it's looking okay. Like it's, um, so it uses both plants in cultivation and plants in the natural environment. And in cultivation, it actually um, at a temperature of say 17 degrees. So for Melbourne 2050, um, it's looking uh, like a good climate match. Now that obviously doesn't, it rules out pests and disease. We know that there are gonna be other things we need to um, uh, deal with, but again, going to 2090, it's an excellent climate match. So just, just on a climate perspective, it would work. So um, use the tool for just, just guiding your decision-making. It is, um, you know, it is a, a guiding tool, um, not anything that's set in concrete. So it just helps. So I just thought I'd check that whilst we're, whilst we're all talking about it. Thanks, Claire. Was there any other questions? Did anyone have any questions? I think that might be it. I think we're nearly at the end of um, our forum. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, thank you to all our presenters today um, for yeah sharing their time and their knowledge. Um, it's wonderful to have you um, come and yeah speak to us for the Be Calm community. So thank you very much. Very appreciated. Um, and also, um, if there's anyone out there in the Be Calm community that um, would like to collaborate and work with our committee, um, just email. Send me an email. And um, yeah, we, we kind of um, collaborate to put these forums together and, and we also work on some other projects. So it's a great team to be part of. So um, yeah, so thanks again, everyone. And um, this is our last forum for the year, actually. So uh, we'll see um, everyone next year and um, I'll send out some um, some more meeting notes and, and uh, forums for next year. But yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sheree. Thanks, Sheree. Thanks, Amanda, Tony.